Oh, April 1st, 2024. It's the meeting of the South Borough Planning Board. The Planning Board is now in session. The first item on the agenda is a discussion item. Five Thayer Lane, Fallen Tree, and No Cut Zone. Karina, you want to bring us up to date? Um, so I was notified from conservation, Melissa Danza, that um, there was a tree that fell in the back of Five Thayer Lane. And in the back of Five Thayer Lane, there's a 20 foot no cut zone um, from a subdivision approval. Um, I just got to remember the name of the subdivision committee. Heritage Crossing from, um, I think it was 2013 timeframe. Um, so uh, Melissa went out and uh, looked at the tree and it had broken off probably from one of the storms, but it also topped off a couple of the other trees adjacent to it. And the trees are located very close to the neighboring garage uh, for 24 East Main Street. Um, they have a garage in the very back corner of the property, which abuts Five Thayer uh, on the other side. Um, so Melissa was recommending that those trees um, be allowed to be cut down to six foot tree butts so that it allows um, the remaining six foot height will allow for um, wildlife to habitat to continue to prosper there or exist. Um, but because this was a subdivision approval, she wanted to make sure the planning board is updated and on board with that. Um, so there were photos and information provided to you. And I think Melissa's letter explained everything. So basically, we wanted to just make sure everybody's on board with that. Very good. Mr. Stein. Sorry, what are, what are we asking us to decide? Exactly. Just checking to make sure you don't have a problem with um, the trees being cut. The, the, the one tree that fell has to be cut and then there it topped off three other three or four other trees right next to it, which are within 10 to 15 feet of the garage. And we're just making sure that because this was a subdivision approval for a no cut zone in the back, meaning you can't cut any trees. Um, Melissa just wanted to make sure the planning boards is okay with um, them. Because trees fell. Yeah, yes. trees fell and broke. Okay, they yep, no problem. Yeah. Ms. Houlihan? Yeah, I had no questions. I was fine with this. Ms. DeMaria? Thank you for going over the procedure. I was wondering what our role in this was. I have no issues or problems with it, too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm fine with it. And thank you to Melissa for, for diligent work. Lisa. Oh, and Lisa, I'm sorry, Lisa. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> Ms. Brashia. I'm fine. I'm fine as well, Mimi. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I will let uh, Melissa know that she can uh, let the uh, resident at Five Thayer move forward. Thanks. The next item on the agenda is a discussion item, recent tree removals. Yes, please, Karina. Um, so last November, um, we received an application from the DPW for resident request tree removals. And um, on that were um, a handful of trees, um, which recently, so let me back up a little bit. So I'm still waiting for an application to be completed so that that can have a consolidated um, tree hearing with the select board and the planning board. Um, but in the meantime, um, a resident at uh, 10 Hillside had um, had his concern that stronger to have the tree removed there. So um, in going out and looking at those trees, the tree warden designee had um, indicated that uh, the tree on 10 Hillside, um, on Oland, and on Chestnut Hill were imminent hazards. So um, he ordered them removed. Um, so they were on the original list. Um, so that's where we are at this point. <laughs> There's a little bit more. Well, actually, where we are is that we received an email that said four trees were removed. And Karina emailed back and said, 
Uh, and in that email that said four trees were removed, it said I have uh, pictures and species and type, et cetera, if you want them. So Karina emailed back and said, please do send the pictures and the type and what was the condition which deemed it uh, an imminent hazard to be removed. And we received a response from um, the DPW superintendent saying, to what end, Chris followed the process. I'm not giving, we're not giving you any more information. Yes. Um, so that was somewhat resistant and reminiscent of the past. Um, so I know that they are understaffed, but um, he and I did meet and um, I listened to what Bill had to say. Um, he was aware that we were talking about this this evening. I made him aware of it. Um, I think he may still follow through with the photos on those um, in a matter of time. I can continue to press him. Well, here's the thing. So then Chris responded, I sent you the, the photos in 11-1, to which I got involved and said, if those are the photos from 11-1 and they were taken down on 3-15, by definition, they're not an imminent hazard. We could have had a hearing. So although Oland is not a scenic road, so those two trees are not within our jurisdiction, the other, Chestnut Hill and Hillside, definitely are. And when a public shade tree, my feeling is, when a public shade tree within the jurisdiction of the planning board is deemed an imminent hazard, we should know why and have pictures as we have in the past when other trees were deemed an imminent hazard, we were shown pictures that clearly showed, yes, I'm in a hazard, you know, but that was not what happened now. And there was a great deal of pushback, which seems we're headed down the same road that we were Is before. Is a scenic road? No. Hillside? Yes. Is. Okay. So the only ones we can disregard. And Chestnut Hill is. And Chestnut Hill. Okay. So the Chestnut Hill one looks like it's in pretty bad shape in that photo. Well, so you have a little picture of the bottom of the, the bark. I drove by there and saw where it was cut down. It wasn't rotted through. So maybe the bark was in bad shape. That doesn't deem it an imminent hazard. And this one on hillside? We have no picture or no, there's no remarks on what the deal with that was. And the picture was a, a Google picture sent from the. So why, what was the reason um, the DPW superintendent didn't allow these to wait for a hearing because he deemed them uh, like a safety risk? Well, what happened is um, the resident at 10 uh, near 10 Hillside, um, Chuck Linton contacted me via email and said, what's the status of the trees? Because I thought, you know, I've been waiting. And I said, well, I'm going to kick it back to the DPW and to the tree warden designee um, because I'm still waiting for an application that's complete, that has a complete spreadsheet that's required by the um, tree policy. So the list we have here, um, it has some columns in it, but the tree policy has specifically identified what needs to be in the spreadsheet. The, a tree ID number, not just an ID for a group of trees, but each tree has to have an ID. There's supposed to be a column with um, the, the tree warden designees comments on the tree and then um, arborists comment on the tree if one exists. So it's my understanding that there's been a little bit of hesitation to, to, to um, indicate that a tree is an imminent hazard or not, but that's why they have an arborist. To, if someone, if the tree warden designee doesn't want to um, take on that opinion, if it's kind of a gray area, he has the arborist to call in and, and okay. I'm just going to it. I'm so just trying to understand is, the process for a second. Yeah. So the the resident reached out to the DPW. Got on the list. Okay. Right. But you never received an application. Who's supposed to submit the application? No, we received an application in November of 2023, but the application was returned because it wasn't complete. To the DPW, DPW. who's the applicant. Okay. So the, the DPW just DPW just never finished the the paperwork. Right, it wasn't completed. Okay. Right. And and if you will call, we did discuss this at a meeting, um, and we had some questions on it that 
that Karina sent back to the DPW. One of the questions of which was, um, are these trees going to be taken down in the winter? And the reason that was asked is because the DPW superintendent went before the select board. Part of the policy was that trees were to be removed in the winter and the fall and the winter because that was less disruptive to wildlife. And he pushed back and said, no, we only remove trees in the summer. So then we get a, an application in November. So one of the questions was, are these going to be removed in the winter? And if no, can we wait until the spring? when the trees have leafed out so we can, when we walk, we can uh, less uh, non-arborists can tell whether trees are alive or not. All right. Is Mr. Cundiff attending this meeting? Uh, I don't see him. We have um, four attendees and the recording clerk. Um, on the same note, at the time when we received the application, in addition to that information about the timing of tree cutting, we were also waiting to be notified for the arborist site visits to the tree so that the planning board would have the opportunity to view the trees along with them. As per the policy. As per the policy. Okay. So, you know, so, it's gotten, it was in limbo now. We were waiting. I mean, since the DPW superintendent reports to the select board, it would seem our next move is to draft correspondence to the select board indicating the DPW superintendent is not complying with the tree policy. If the planning board so decides, absolutely. Ms. Houlihan. So in spirit of just trying to like be good collaborators, I, I get it. Um, I know he waited till March and his point back was we're down three people in the office. Yes. Um, at this point, he's basically said we're not going to furnish any additional information as I understand it. Um, I think on the hazardous, imminent hazard ones that were cut down. Okay. But I think, I, I'm hoping, I, I believe they're working on completing the application to get it in. That's my understanding, but. So I guess, is there like a good gesture or good faith effort that we can do instead of like formalizing in a letter that says, you know, you're non-compliant or just to say like, how do, how do we, how do we make this process better? Because I, I don't want to go down this whole route again with a DPW that's not a collaborator, because that's not what we want. That's not good for no. the town. And like, do, does someone like pick up the phone and see if Bill will have a conversation? Yes. What we did is um, we said, um, let's have a meeting on this application. Let's sit down and go over it through with the tree policy and the application that you did submit. And I can clearly show Chris what has to be added in case there's any confusion, you know, because the tree policy has some pretty detailed information. But it's clear if you just look at it. It's not a long policy. But we offered that up, and Mimi also offered to be a part of that meeting with me and Bill kind of, and um, with Chris LaRoy. So I asked, when would you be available? I'm still waiting. So do we need Bill there, or can we just have Chris there? Because Chris have... has always been a really good partner for us. Yeah. And then as long as Bill signs off on it. I so... think it's, it's because um, Bill has staff that prepares these spreadsheets. So he's in, he would be involved in that level because Chris Leroy is really the tree warden designee. But it appears, so we've had a few very successful hearings that right. Chris did all the work on, but it appears that there's pushback from the new DPW superintendent. And I'd just like to convey in, um, that he expressed in his, when he stopped by the office last week, um, to talk to me about various things that, you know, their concern, Bill's concern specifically, I think one of the strongest points is that he's afraid of liability, that if we don't take down a tree because we wait too long and then something does happen, I know that's one of his hot, hot button issues on the, tr you know, being able to designate it eminent hazard or not. They want the flexibility to, they just, I, I don't know how else to say it, but that's the biggest concern. Um, so, but all we asked is why was an imminent hazard? Right. So right. we're not saying if it is, don't take it down. We're saying right. we want, we just want to know. Right. And I, I, I express that. Um, so I'm optimistic that we can still work something out. Um, I mean, my comment is, I guess on, 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 
they're done, that the trees are down. So if there is an opportunity to understand why, I'm sure Chris could tell us verbally if yeah. that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. And then on this, if we can just, um, I, I guess I would not want to formalize a letter of non-compliance. I'd really just try to figure out how do we work collaborati collaboratively? And we're not, we don't want to stop any imminent hazards. If it's a hazard, it's a hazard. And they know that mm -hmm. best. And I am I'm fully of support of that decision. I think it's just letting us know why. And I think there's that conversation. So I'd be an advocate of just reaching back out and saying, hey, it would be great if we could just, you know, have a whatever a meeting. And if it's only, you know, whoever can do it, if you can't make it and I can make it or Deb can make it or somebody, I just feel like someone just to, to reach that olive branch out is the best way to manage this. Mm -hmm. And I also feel that, you know, the policy that's been accepted by the select board that the planning board worked with the select board on and select board as the tree warden was accepted as a policy to follow. Um, and in my past experience working through that similar flow chart that Lisa Braccio had prepared prior to the formal policy, it worked well. It worked well. Um, I don't know. The specific, I, I know a few reasons why it starts to fall apart is because there's concern with the liability and the, um, the right. But it, evidence has shown that the trees have stood longer than, you know, the three and a half, four weeks it takes to have a public hearing uh, process. So, Mr. Murray. So I have a slightly different perspective. Um, so at town meeting, um, we passed, town passed Article 33, which um, amends Chapter 447 of um, the 1991 Legislative Acts that um, dissolves the Public Works Planning Board and establishes the Office of the Tree Warden. And I, I brought issues about my issues, personal kind of issues, to this board before um, and I think I'm going to bring it up again. The real issue, I think, is that we, we simply don't have the expertise. We we just don't. We, we really need to understand we're out of compliance with the Mass General Law and the spirit of having a qualified tree warden. We're a town over 10,000 people, and we need to have a qualified tree warden. We don't have it. The DPW chief can't be expected to be it. The select board is no longer it, or soon won't be it. And, and Chris Leroy is also not it. We don't have the expertise. So although we have a policy, um, I, I really think this is an opportunity for us to uh, kind of weigh in and work with Bill and Chris about what we actually need. I don't think there's any shame in it. I think it's the same as if, for example, Bill put in for a a uh, civil engineer, try as long as he could without an engineer or made do with consultants and finally said, I need an engineer. And I think, and I supported that, to be honest. And I hope that he would acknowledge he needs a tree warden. And I think that, you know, we're going to suffer with this as long as we keep getting like applications that says, um, neighbor is concerned with no details or safety hazard or one of them that was forwarded was actually blank I don't, I don't recall if that was on the scenic road or a different that was that was the hillside that is now oh. gone so that's just simply not acceptable so we've been putting processes in place that's supported by this the select board and now the public body says we need a tree warden we need a qualified tree warden now we can argue over what does that actually mean but it's somebody who really knows trees and we don't have it we just don't have it so i mean my suggestion would be to really have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with, if it's both, you know, the dialogue I've had with Bill has been, he's pulled in Chris to have the discussion, anything having to do with trees. And that there's just no shame in it. We really need something better than this. And I think it, the vision coming from the planning board as to what that tree warden would look like, whether that person is an arborist, whether we use a consultant arborist, but this is something that we have nobody giving direction. That's the problem. We're relying on, you know, the neighbors call, and if they're the squeaky wheel, the tree gets taken down. That's not what the vision of protecting scenic roads is. So I think we need to do better. We have an opportunity now to 
I think, work with Bill on what the tree warden um, looks like, and it doesn't look like anything like we have right now. We have to change it. So that's where I'd like to put the energy. Um, as a first stab, as you know, um, the group, Tim Litt and Sam Stivers and I put together a, um, a you know, a tree warden um, job description. Maybe Mr. Litt can talk about whether that's been accepted or not accepted because I haven't been involved in that conversation, but I really think the planning board should take a, a look at that because this could potentially be a different person that we're working with who has the qualifications to bring Southboro into the 21st century because we're not there. So, Ms. Braschio? Thank you, Mimi. I guess one of the things I'm most concerned about and, and and I agree, Mimi, that there, there's a, um, Marnie, sorry, that there's a, a spirit of collaboration that we want. But when this tree, imminent hazard trees came down on Latasquama and on Sears Road, we were provided information. And I guess that's where I have a concern. Um, nobody has an issue with them coming down, but to be provided information as to why, whether, you know, it takes five minutes to put a new meal together. So I think as we go forward, we need to be very clear that, you know, we still have those set expectations, um, you know, before a hazard tree comes down. I mean, there was time in between realizing it was an imminent hazard and bringing a tree company out. So again, I, I think we need to stress that, you know, uh, time needs to be taken so that, that we as stewards, um, you know, of the public shade trees that we understand. So thank you. Thank you. And I, so I believe in the spirit of collaboration also. My concern was this was seemed purposefully obstructionist as if the elected planning board who has jurisdiction over scenic roads has no business asking any questions. And he's a government entity. Everything is public record. Anyone can ask questions. You know, anyone can do a public records request and get all kinds of information. And for him to just shut down the the town planner and the planning, the planning board chair was just unacceptable. But I'd be happy to try again, sit down and talk to him. Let's see. And, you know, try and figure out where we go from here as far as a as a tree ward and something that works better. Because I think I think Chris can do a good job, but he's pulled by and pushed and pulled by whoever's the DPW superintendent. And it appears we've had two that are not fans of trees or following Mass General Law Chapter 87, which is unfortunate because we are a tree city. The legislative body voted that we're a tree city. And regardless of what one's personal opinion is, you're required to follow the desire of the legislative body, which is a tree city to follow chapter 87. Mr. Litt. Tim Litt, Woodland Grove. Um, so I agree with Mr. Muria that this is an opportunity to try and figure out what the right path is for a new tree warden. I would suggest that it might be a good idea to do this, not just as the planning board, but look at the other stakeholders, such as conservation, who have a big interest in the tree warden and, and what they do. Um, I think there's been a certain amount of tension that it's only the planning board versus um, the DPW superintendent have a unified path. Um, as far as the status of the job description, yes, um, I had drafted and everyone had looked over a rather generic job description that provided options for how the um, position might be filled because I could see it being filled as you know something shared with other communities you know as a contract person as an employee um, there's a couple of ways that that one could go at it um, there also are a few PowerPoint slides that we put together that go through the um, interpretation of what a tree warden is and what the references are, you know, both uh, in terms of accepted practice, what some other towns are doing and all that. Um, the conversations that we've had with, with Bill Cundiff, um, he has been 
um, reluctant to go the arborist route. I think he's interested in uh, protecting Chris and you know his role. Um, from the first conversation I had with him, it was, gee, you know, Chris is valuable. He has a lot to, to offer and could certainly be a great um, you know, deputy tree warden, which a tree warden can uh, appoint, or you know, some other role that takes advantage. But my reading, and I think Mr. Muir, Muria would agree, of the statute and the interpretations by the you know, Foresters and Tree Wardens Association and by the bill that's been in the legislature several times is that, no, gee, we're really looking for a certified arborist you know, to hold the position. That doesn't mean that he doesn't get help or staff or support. Um, but those are the, the, the things I'd encourage you to think about in this. And of course, if there's anything I can do to help the screen quietly. Thank you. Sure. Um, so just a little bit more information. So in speaking with Bill, I did try to convey that regardless of personal feelings about trees, and then he expressed the concern with liability, I said, you know, this policy that took a lot of time to put together was accepted by the town. And I don't live in town, he doesn't live in town, and that we should respect the boards who put this in place to do that. And then we also need to respect the fact that the policy has certain requirements. So if that's there, for example, there's a tree assessment form, um, which I know Bill is not comfortable with. And he expressed that and I said, well, it was part of the policy, it's written in there that it's supposed to be filled out. And I think it had been vetted with Cliff, um, the arborist, um, who was familiar with that form. Um, so there again, um, you know, I don't know where the line, I know where the line should be drawn, but I'm not sure I'm the one to draw it. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to do it in a collaborative fashion. Um, and that takes time um, and diligence and just keeping saying the same things over. No, this is what we need. This is what we need. And eventually you get what you want and then slowly maybe, but that takes time and trees go down in that time frame. So I appreciate any assistance. Well, uh, I'll certainly be in on a conversation. Thank you. I know you already said you would. So we'll push for a meeting to review this current application. And well, so maybe the application, but this particular situation and discuss oh. tree warden. Right, right. Okay, and also getting information on um, hazardous, imminent hazard trees, whether it's right before or after some that, and I, and I expressed that. I said, if we had the information, I can share it with the board and they would feel more comfortable because they would see, oh yeah, look at that was rotted and all. And you know, all this, all this resistance would go away from their side. Which is what has happened in the past. Right. Okay. Anything else on this? The next item on the agenda is a, an a and 26 Edward, Edgewood Road. In, in the interest of full disclosure, I live on Oregon, but I'm 943 feet mm -hmm. from this property, so I don't have to recuse myself. <laughs> yes. John Kiley, he's Hi. one of the landowners of the property. I'm Peter Lothian, one of the PGT Associates. Okay. Um, Karina will start us off, and then we'll throw it over to you. Is an A&R for 26 Edgewood Road. Um, the property owner and applicant is Mr. John Kiley, who's present. Thank you for coming. And he has his um, surveyor with him, Peter, the DGT. Um, just go a little further here. Hold on a second. Um, so what this is, is there's currently two parcels 
in existence there. And one is very small and the other is much larger. And the applicant would like to reconfigure the line that splits these two lots to make two lots that are more equal in size so that there's two buildable lots. Right. And the drawing is up here. Um, you can see that there's wetlands um, shown on the very right side of the lot B. Um, however, there's still access at the bottom. Um, I fully reviewed this plan. I checked the deed references. I checked the butter list. Uh, all the information that is required on the A&R is there. Um, the surveyor, uh, Peter, actually did a, a, re a revision or two to meet those standards, and then we did a final review, and everything seems to be in order. Thank you, Karina. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Not really. I mean, the okay. Adequate for it. <laughs> Mr. Stein. No questions. Ms. Houlihan. No questions. Ms. DeMaria. No questions. Ms. Braccio. No questions. Thank you. I have no questions. Looks like adequate frontage. And as Karina said, you can, there's access, even though there are wetlands there. Um, I would note that there are stone walls there and it's a scenic road. So if you're going to do anything with the stone walls, you we're have to come before the planning board. There's an existing driveway already. We're going to use that drive. Very good. Yep. I made sure I made them aware of it. And they also put the identified it as a scenic road on the A&R. Well, that doesn't get missed at the building department. Okay. Very good. Mr. Stein. To make a motion that the planning board approve the ANR for 26 Edgewood Road. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor. Luttrell, yes. Stein, yes. Lehan, yes. Demiria, yes. Brasho, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll have that plan endorsed at the end of the night with a, um, an endorsement form that gets filed with the town clerk. And as soon as it's ready, I'll give you a call and you can come pick it up. Thank All right, thank you. thank you. Next item on the agenda is a discussion item, 2024 annual town meeting debrief. All right, so although I did not attend after the pre-meeting for the planning board, I did watch significant portions of it <laughs> while it was going on, uh, maybe a little bit after the fact, because you can rewind. Um, so as you know, the planning board had um, warrant article number 37 was the downtown district. Wait, 36, 36 was the downtown district, um, and that passed. Jesse... I saw did a great job with this presentation and I don't think there were a lot of questions and that information's already been given to the town clerk to send to the attorney general office for review. The other article 37 was the ZBA chapter 174-9 um, regarding the lapse of special permits to be two years. And I think there was an amendment on the floor um, from Mr. Jack Bartolini regarding um, a single extension was removed, right? The word single. Um, and I think that was the only amendment. Um, so yeah, you know, I think it did. Now we could, okay, good. Um, so those two, um, I saw the presentation that Marnie gave for the MBTA communities, and that was excellent as well. I think the, um, the applause that you got at the end was representative of how they appreciated that information that you put the effort in and that the planning board did. And um, we're gonna forge forward one way or another on that one. Um, other than that, um, I think the planning board budget had no questions and that passed. Um, and that's what I kind of focused on the planning board related. 
Mimi, if there's anything else you can remember that was significant. No, um, great job, Marnie and Jesse. Thank you very much. Um, in the, the Public Works Advisory Committee did not pass, so we may want to, um, the board may want to take another look at that. Is that going to come back, do you think, Debbie, I hope? Yep, yeah, so we haven't met as a group. We just had some back and forth dialogue. Um, but based on the comments that were made, um, you know, it appears that there's a work you know, a work around or work in progress that, that could happen to, you know, um, address some of the concerns that were raised. It seems like it, to me it was more of a wording issue or certain things that were included and not included. It's a little kind of minor stuff, to be honest. So, yeah, that would be the plan to be confirmed, you know, within the group, the working group, and also um, with a select board. But I imagine that it would, um, you know, be fairly simple to address and also to bring it back to select, uh, special town meeting in the fall. Yeah. So by um, what, what do you mean by planning board? Just that you would, you would take a look at it, the revised version when it comes around, or did you yeah. have more of an input? E either way. My, my take was that it was too complicated and needed to be simplified. Yeah, I mean, I have, I'll bring up, I'll be honest that I had some people who came to me and had concerns about it, like separate from what was put on, on the floor. Um, I think we did hear about the, the makeup of the committee, um, proposed committee, and whether or not we should have um, or allow, I think one of the comments made was about um, town employees and whether they could be a member of that group and somebody came to me later and said well it's probably like more like dpw employees that possibly should be excluded from that group um and these may be the retired employees from dpw or something like that i believe we happen to have two dpw employees currently on the public works planning board right now so you could you know we can debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing um and another comment that i heard was um someone who thought that there should be a member of the planning board on public works uh, advisory committee. And that wasn't part of what, um, you know, we put forward at town meeting. So if that is something that the planning board thinks has merit, I'd like to hear from the, the planning board. Um, I just wanna say, you know, um, I could see it being very favorable to have kind of a special uh, envoy or something on that committee. I don't know whether others select board would agree, um, but I would like to hear from the planning board about about that when it comes around. Yeah. Anything else? Ms. Braschio? Nothing else, thank you. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is a public hearing, 118-120 Turnpike Road modification of 2019 major site plan approval and modification of 2019 special permit for lower impact development. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. Do you want me to give the full status? Take it away, Karina. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll open the public hearing first. So we can get started or you want me to update where we're at before we open the public hearing because we have to open it and then continue okay okay so we'll open the public hearing officially and then we'll give a quick status and then we'll um hopefully have a motion to continue to a date thank you you're welcome. Uh, so this is the public hearing notice for modification to the 2019 major site plan and special permit for low impact development approvals. 118 to 120 Turnpike Road, Assessor's Map 37, parcels 118-4 and 120-4. Per section 174-10 and section 174-13.3, the Southwell Zoning Code, the Southwell Planning Board shall hold public hearings on Monday, April 1st. 2024 at 7 p.m. in the McAuliffe Hearing Room, second floor, Townhouse 17 Common Street, Southboro, Mass., to consider the applications of FD 120 Turnpike LLC 
regarding the property located at 118 120 Turnpike Road for modification to the 2019 major site plan, special permit for lower impact development lid approvals. These hearings concern a modification to the August 26, 2019 major site plan and special permit LD decisions, lid, I'm sorry, special permit lid decisions of approval for the 118 120 Turnpike Road located in the Highway Business and Residence A Zoning District. These approvals include conditions and findings related to a 6.2 acre portion of land to be donated to the Conservation Commission. The applicant seeks to modify the conditions and findings. A copy of the plans and application may be reviewed at the planning office at the South Road Townhouse during normal business hours or on the planning board's webpage at um, www.southboroughma.gov slash 552 slash planning dash board. Any person wishing to be heard on the proposed changes should appear at the time and place designated or virtually at the following link at um, mass.southborough.civicplus.com slash 674 dash virtual dash meetings. Mimi Luttrell, Chair, Southborough Planning Board. Um, and then a quick update is that um, it was discovered today that the abutter notifications did not get sent out um, as required by state statute, um, which requires green card re uh, certified return receipts by a Thursday prior to the public hearing opening and the mailing receipts. So it is listed in the instructions. Um, However, they also did not receive a copy of the legal ad from us, which we typically send when we put it in the newspaper. Um, so that combination created this problem today. And I apologize on the planning board's part for not having um, noticed that that legal ad hadn't gotten sent out um, to the applicant. Um, and to be clear, there was uh, ads in the newspaper as required, so just not the green cards or the certified mail. Yeah, that's correct. And um, just to point out that um, the application was received on March 6th. It was filed with the town clerk on March 14th. Uh, the major site plan has a time um, to act for 60 days and the special permit 90 days. Um, the approval deadline for the site plan is May 13th. So the special permit lid is June 12th. Um, our next planning board meeting is um, April 29th. Um, this was distributed to the department heads and boards and committees on March 15th, run in the newspaper on March 18th and March 25th. Um, it was actually sent to the newspaper and the town clerk, the, the legal ad on March 13th uh, with a hearing date of today. Um, and mailed out to the towns and agencies on March 13th as well. So it was the butter notification. So I spoke with town council this afternoon and he recommended that um, the best way to handle this is to open the public hearing this evening and continue without testimony other than administrative discussion. So no discussion of the merits of the project or the request um, and that's why town council is not here because he knew um, that this was going to happen. And I um, let Mimi know right away when this came about. And we went back and forth with town council with questions to make sure that we were doing everything in accordance with law, um, which is what we're doing. Um, so I spoke with town council and he does not have availability on the 29th of April to return here because he has town meetings that day, but he, said that he would um, have another person available if we decide to go on that date, although he wanted to be the counsel who's here, but he would make someone available. Um, and then he gave me two other dates, actually three dates when he could be available. And um, one was, um, ah, I didn't bring my calendar here. One was, um, April 22nd, um, but that's the beginning of Passover. So usually we try not to um, have a meeting that evening because sundown is probably within a half hour of the meeting start. The next um, time was the following Wednesday, the, which is, let me just look on my phone. Let me, let me just take a peek here real quick. 
But I think, are you scheduled at the ZBA on the 24th? Yeah, the 24th. So that would not work. And then um, May 1st. So, and that's Jesse's birthday, yes. So those were the three choices. It was the 22nd, yeah, the 25th and the May 1st at which um, Town Council Talaman was available. Okay. Um, so that leaves any more discussion to me. Oh, okay. Very good. Discuss. Good evening. Good evening. So is it your wish to continue without finding? Yes. And would you prefer the 29th? Uh, on or before the 29th, so either the 29th or the 22nd, if that's still available. But if not, that we can move forward on the 29th. Yeah, the, the 22nd is the first night of Passover, and that, I'm not going to meet on that night. Yep. So the 29th. The 29th yep. Yeah, which is our next meeting. Unless you all want us to bring a birthday cake on the 1st. <laughs> Um, and yes, just recognize that this is two hearings because it's a modification to the site plan and a modification to the special permit. So Mr. Stein. Yeah, just quick question. One of my neighbors was jogging on Breakneck Hill Road and saw that a lot of clear cutting had been done in the land that seems to be, I, has your client started clear cutting the land? Not to our knowledge. The land is still 100% undisturbed. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that the public hearing, do I have to do two different ones or? Uh, you can do it in one. Okay, so the motion is for public hearings for 118, 120 Turnpike Road, modification to 2019 major site plan approval and uh, modification to 2019 special permit for LID be continued without testimony to April 29th at 7 p.m. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, Luttrell, yes. Stein, yes. Julian, yes. Demiria, yes. All right, so. Wait a minute, Lisa. Oh, Lisa. Ms. Braccio? Sorry, Braccio, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So you continued to the 29th, 7 8 p.m., not a.m. I had written that before. <laughs> um, and I had one other question. Um, I've received photos of a, of a salt shed structure in the back of 118, 120 in the back parking lot. Also some pictures of, I think what Jesse meant, there was, there's some a big pile of uh, trees, stumps, albeit from the picture, the trees look like they're older, had been cut down, but, but the salt shed, and I'm not aware if you have a building permit for that or not, because um, A, it requires a building permit, and the building department called me about it the other day. So do you have any information in regards to that? Not at all, but we'll look into that other point. Yeah, and it appears to be a storage of a boat and some other construction equipment along with it. And it looks like a salt shed and it looks like, it's large enough to be considered a structure per the definition of 174-2 zoning code. Um, so you may wanna follow up with, um, we have an interim um, building commissioner being appointed tomorrow evening. His name's Gene Novak. So you should definitely contact him to avoid any conflicts with the process. Will do. And thank you for working with us today on this dilemma. Well, you'll get us the updated ad. We'll be sure it goes out as required by certified mail. Yes, we'll do that tomorrow. We'll set this up and get it right to you. It'll be a new ad with a new date, but there'll be an explanation that it's a continued public hearing. All right, um, and if the planning board wants us to, we could run the newspaper ad one more time. Um, uh, ta uh, town council said it's not a bad idea. You don't have to, but we could. And if the municipality puts it in, it's a much lower rate. It's probably in the $100 range. Um, and I feel that would be something we could do to, yeah. to share that burden. 
appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Madam Chair, is it, is it possible at some time to make a public comment that would take about two minutes? Um, with regards to? To um, the dirt piles on Newton and Main Street and where Andrea's restaurant is being torn down. So, Ms. Robbins, what agenda item is this that you're? It's not on the agenda. I, I didn't know when there was a time to have a public comment about a topic that's not on the agenda. We don't do that. We have I, it has I to be an agenda. Minutes of a comment to make. I mean, I, I I guess we we could if the board is willing to hear during um, other business before the planning board during the planners report. Or I can come back if you'd like. I my recommendation would be to go through the town planner to request uh, being on I our agenda. A suggestion to her. I did ask, mention I wanted to okay. speak before the planning. No, actually, Chris, we talked about it on the phone, and with no disrespect, but I did say that you should send me a request to get on a planning board meeting. Um, okay. But I did let you know that you have to send in a request to get on the meeting. So we were generally speaking about it. Karina, can I ask a question? Sure. The town has a public comment policy correct and i don't know does that pleasure. apply to the planning board as well as any board i don't know that answer i would have to research and i think it i don't happen to know what it says to be honest is it it's in the does, code does the town have a public comment oh, okay If Chris, if you want to wait until the planner's report, which is at the end of the agenda, we'd be happy to hear what you have to say. What time is it? Well, I don't, I don't, well, it's hard to say. I, is it an hour? Is it a 10 minutes? Or? It's not 10 minutes. I can tell you that for sure. Oh, no, but can you just give me a range? I don't want to, you can come back. Uh, probably, hour probably hour? an hour and a half or so. How many minutes? You might have some room. Yeah. Or if you prefer, I can come to another meeting. Um, it's up to you. If you want to, if you want to wait to the end of the meeting, which will probably be an hour and a half or so. So that would be. <laughs> I'm not looking at the watch, but. Ten o'clock. What time? Ten o'clock. Want me to bring the donuts and the coffee? <laughs> you deserve it. Okay. We'll be here, we'll be here till, till nine. All right. Yeah, you can get on Zoom. Oh, it's only seven twenty. Will I still be? Nine. Nine. Oh, nine. nine. That's better. You can come in. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chris. Oh, yeah. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a discussion item, MBTA Communities Multifamily Zoning. Karina. So as we talked about before, we did have, um, presentation from Marnie Houlihan at the uh, 2024 annual town meeting. Um, also uh, at the select boards meeting on, was it March 19th? I believe it was. Um, the planning board attended and there was discussion on how to approach um, this whole predicament of the compliance model, et cetera. So um, Mimi and Marnie worked on a draft letter to the um, EOHLC, formerly the DHCD, to identify um, the concerns the town has and express um, the need for an extension or relaxing of the requirement of the unit capacity down within half mile of the train station because there's a lot of historic property in that area and it would really change the character of that area. 
Um, also noting that the town only has half a radius there because it's on the border of the town. So there's not a whole 50, um, uh, uh, what did I say, a, a, a half a mile radius is a circle. There's only half a circle there. Um, so I did update uh, town council this afternoon um, that the planning board would be discussing it this evening and that um, it was agreed and approved already at the select board meeting that the letter would be reviewed by town council. And um, Jay said, Jay Talman, town council said that um, please send it to Elizabeth Lydon, who has been um, having her finger on the pulse of the MBTA communities and to him as well, and that she would be assigned to look at it. She would be the person with her experience in it. And she's also the uh, town council who reviewed the bylaw with us and with Emily Innes, the um, consultant for Bowler who did the bylaw. Um, and then um, it'll go, once the planning board has that, it'll go to the select board as well for their um, review. Thank you. So I, as we discussed with the select board, I envisioned we work on two tracks to lobby the state to try and get some relaxation of the unit capacity in extension of the uh, compliance date and then try to comply. And um, I spoke with Mr. Pfaff after annual town meeting and asked if he'd be willing to teach me how to do the compliance model. Because in my mind, the I'm thinking the only way we can figure out how to make something comply is dropping um, parcels in and out until something complies. And, you know, Bowler will give us one shot and that's not very helpful, I think. So he said he'd be willing, he'd be willing to do that. Um, so I, so if the board approves of this letter, as Karina said, we'll send it on to council for, um, for opinion and, and review on if they have any ideas on how best to, uh, ask the state and, um, and then to the select board who said they would sign on with us. Mr. Starr. I did um, just start formatting it into planning boards. It's the same letter. I haven't changed it. So that's why there were two copies up there. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, publicly thank uh, Andrew Pfaff for his work and his uh, foresight um, in delving into um, you know the review of Bowler's work. It, honestly, it got by me that uh, Bowler was an error, uh, but Mr. Pfaff caught it. And, uh, you know, I really feel like uh, we've gotten really um, unacceptable uh, performance by this consultant. Um, I'm not sure where we go from here in working with this vendor. Um, and I really um, am appreciative of the people that worked on this letter to the state because, uh, you know, I hope that they get the message that uh, the consultant that uh, they're contracting with, um, you know, needs to be accountable for this uh, situation. And um, we, we as a town really need relief from this uh, unfair and uh, extremely onerous and unreasonable um, position by the, by the state. Thank you. Ms. Houlihan. Yeah, so I just had two comments. So the first was um, the second to last paragraph. We still have I, uh, that we would only fulfill the 3.2% unit capacity. Mimi, in your email, you said you thought it was higher. So I think we have to make that um, the right number. And I just don't know what it was from the, I think it was 6.5%. So that has to change. Yeah, so was it 49 units? Yeah, we couldn't remember if it was there? 49 or 79. That's that's what I... That's not 33. It's 150. Oh, yeah, I guess that is. So it was 33 
percent of what was supposed to be a hundred percent of that twenty percent of the seven fifty, right, right. which is why it was so confusing. Right. So it was only forty nine. So I think I took forty nine by seven fifty. So that's the six point five percent yeah. unit capacity. Yeah. In what we Where's were required to be at 20. twenty. Yeah. So I would say it's a six point five percent that okay. needs to change in there. And then my second comment was as an attachment, um, we just had the minutes to review if we if we approve them this evening for March 4th, because I do think that captures Bowler's um, explanation in air quotes of what they did wrong, that they didn't actually ever say they did anything wrong. Um, but I think it just kind of provi provides the public commentary around what happened in that and, and that it happened on March 4th. Um, when we had a March 23rd public here um, town meeting. So yeah, those are my two comments. But and what was the map that you wanted? The GPS map? I didn't. Um, the, the, the GP, the map of the, um, the, the South Borough district of, of area number one. Oh, okay. So the district map. Yeah. So it was at sbr.c. So I wanted to kind of show the, the area one and what we had designated in pink. And then the SBRC, which is the, the Historical Society designation of Cordeville being historic. Oh, okay. So they saw it was like the whole area is a historic area. So where do we go from there for 150 units? And we're not, maybe, I don't personally want to change underlying zoning there. I don't I think that to... stays in line with what we're supposed to do as a planning board. I just want to be 100% clear what's happening. The District 1. Just the district one map that was mapped by Bowler? Um, I think it was the map that helped that Colleen, maybe it was Bowler's, but it, it helped illustrate exactly what properties were included in area one. And literally the SBRC, the historic society map, oh, I put that on. outlines those same properties as all very historic properties. So it's just, it's further illustration that everything that we designated mm -hmm is historic one that you shaded with blue pink i thought it was pink yeah. one that was shaded with the yes it was most recently yes okay. yeah so there's two maps yes okay and i'm happy to swing by and like pull together the attachments if that helps we have the minutes i just wanted to be crystal clear yeah. map because there's a lot of there were a lot of maps yes okay. thank you mr murray uh, my only thought was um, at the, the the letter that the planning board originally wrote when the MBTA Communities Act was still in draft and we had the opportunity to provide comment. Did that go to this group? Do they have it or can can and should we attach the letter or will they have it on? That, that went to the to the secretary. It was a different secretary at the time, but that group will have it. Okay. Can can we reference that in this letter or attach it? I think it had a, a little bit more because it was a little bit. Oh yeah, centered, you know, on focused. I mean, I I, I think um, that would be my only comment if we can attach it. Yeah. So I'm sorry, just clarify one more time. This was the letter that the original the comment of? letter back when um, the guidance first came out and it was 50 acres within a half mile. Mm -hmm. um, we sent comment to the state prior. They had a what comment period. And boards had done each. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I know what you're talking about. Well, actually, we sent, so we worked with um, the select board and uh, Shopsy. Yep. And the select board, though, had sent their own letter. No. Right? That was No, it was one. one letter. Okay. One letter. That's right. Okay. Two minutes. Yosef? Ms. Brasio? No comments per se, other than to thank um, Mimi, Marnie, and Karina for working on putting this letter together. It looks great. Thank you. I didn't do much on it, Lisa. I'm not taking credit. <laughs> <laughs> I did review it, but it. So are we in agreement with the path forward to try and um, I'll see if when I can, when Andrew Pfaff can meet and drop different just drop different lots in and see if we can ever get to that capacity number. Okay. And then this will go to town council and then to the select board for approval. 
Yes. Just a question in general, because I know we we don't have a new warrant article because we don't have any lots that are in compliance right now. We're going to just continue this discussion open to public comment until we have a point where we have dropped enough properties in there and we can assess a new potential because the plan is to still pursue compliance as well as this other path. Just confirming. Thanks. Any other comment? Would we copy the AG office on that letter? So the AG just looks at it for um, legal compliance within Mass General Law. They're kind of working together, but they're not looking at compliance with 3A at all. Sorry, Ms. Luttrell. One more comment is my recollection is that um, Healy's office reached out directly to Tallerman, Councilman Tallerman, to say what's the status, heard it got pulled or something. Do we think we should leverage that communication point to be able to forward this letter in that fashion since we're writing it? We should also say, by the way, we've sent this letter. I don't think it's a bad idea if there's a direct line of communication, we should probably use that as a leverage point. Okay. I think that was the Worcester AG, Margaret Hurley. So she's the municipal, I don't know her title right offhand, but she she's the one that will be reviewing the bylaws. No, no, she's with the AG's assist. She's with the AG office. She's listed as Chief Central Massachusetts Division at Mass, Mass Attorney General's Office. I'm sorry. We do have Margaret Hurley's email, so we'll include her. So are we good with this? No, this is important. We got to. Anything else, Lisa, on this? No, thank you, Mamie. Okay. Any questions or comments? Of course, it's all public. You're, uh, you're still writing this letter, so we don't have a time frame when that would be made public. Um, Can we go to mine? Yeah. Here you go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for all the work all of you have been doing on this. It's been stressful and uh, been putting a lot of work on this thing. Thank you. All right. So the next item is a discussion item, Northboro Road, Chapter 61, Parcels, Right of First Refusal. I think... Lisa, do you want to um, update us on this one? Sure, Mimi. And I know you were there too, so feel free to jump in. 
Um, so the other day, um, Open Space, Shopsy uh, met to discuss um, the Chapter 61, a parcels they talked about. Um, a little bit about cost, a little bit about interest. Um, one of the things they're still waiting to hear back on is if the um, applicants uh, has responded to the letter that was sent by the select board in town council that um, it was a not a bona fide offer. Uh, they're still waiting to hear back. My understanding is of that. Um, Shopsy and um, Open Space expressed an interest on uh, potentially a joint project. Um, there was discussion regarding if it's one parcel or two parcels, it depended how it went into 61A. I'm not sure if there's an answer to that question yet. I know the assessor's office, I spoke to them briefly last week, they were working on um, hopefully having an answer um, before the end of this week. Um, this discussion is also on the CPC agenda for this coming Thursday. Um, but there was certainly interest, um, again, there was a, a lot of discussion on whether it was one parcel or two. It'd be tougher to fund it if it was if it was two parcels. Uh, Mimi, what did I miss? Nothing. I think that it's pretty much it was um, everyone was in agreement. Um, and it's, it seemed to be the agreement was if if um, if it was the two parcels, the town probably couldn't afford it. If it was uh, if we could do either either parcel, I guess if they go into chapter 61 as separate parcels, then you can um, exercise your right on either or or both. If they both go into the uh, chapter together, then you have to exercise your right on both of them, which um, would be too expensive for the town. But if it was one parcel, then it would be doable in both um, Shopsy and open space um, we're interested in working together um, with CPA funding and bonding capacity to uh, do a joint affordable housing open space project. And might I add that um, Dorian Jasinski had posted a Shopsy meeting for the uh, uh, Community Preservation Committee on uh, this Thursday, but there wasn't um, one posted yet for CPC. Community Preservation Committee, and also there was a conflict that this um, that the um, public safety building conference room was already booked. So um, just be aware that it may change to somewhere else in case you want to attend. Okay. Any comment, Mr. Stein? No. Ms. Houlihan. No, thank you, Mimi and Lisa, for attending that. It's really interesting. And I'm just curious when it's a Chapter 61 parcel, um, is there any way you could pull in like a third party to negotiate or does that complicate it too much? N not negotiate, but I mean to pull in to try and fund it for the town. I think that you can assign your right to somebody else. A lot of times um, towns assign right of first refusals to land trusts, but I don't know if we have local land trusts that would be able to afford it. Amy? I've also seen them do it um, to sign the rights over to the water department. The water department. Yeah. To use as and a if I, well field. And if I can just add to that, you know, we're still moving forward as if the 120 day clock is ticking, which takes us to June. So it's, it's tough and it's tight to even try to put anything together. I think it's a great idea, Marnie. I just don't know if there's the time to do that. Yeah, I didn't know if there was like a, you know, a white a knight on in shining armor that wants to ride in a white horse and come in and fund it. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Thanks. Could affordable housing trust fund be considered for this only, or if only if it was geared for affordable housing? Oh yeah. Because yeah. I believe there's monies there that shop, both Shopsy and uh, the affordable housing trust fund were targeting. It's a little bit problematic, though, because I believe the chair of the uh, Affordable Housing Trust has recused himself from this matter. If I'm not mistaken, Mr. Hamilton. So I'm not he sure. He did, Jesse. But it shouldn't affect if the trust can get involved. All they need is a quorum of the trust and there's seven members. So any other member of the trust could step in 
to, you know, chair or uh, take a position or a vote. I, I think the more problematic thing is you have five members of the select board on the trust and at the select board's initial meeting on this, they were ready to um, not exercise the right. So, um, you know, again, I, I think we all need to move forward and the, um, the select board are requiring proposals to them by April 12th. So, you know, that's 11 days away. It's a short window to try to put something together. I mean, ultimately the select board uh, has to exercise the right of first refusal and the trust also, you know, has to um, agree to utilize the $400,000 plus that are currently sitting in the trust account. Mr. Murray? I just want to um, make one comment that thank you for the board's leadership on this and to CHOPC, CPC, Open Space, and all the other committees that stepped forward. When this was first announced at the select board, and I think I was sitting in the back of the room, um, the comments made were, this is too expensive and the town can't afford it, without talking to any other committee or board. And I thought that was not a, a show of leadership. I think that was pretty bad. Um, it, it turns out that I think that this is maybe equates to two hundred fifty thousand dollars an uh, uh, an acre, or so, and that's about the going rate in in Southboro, if I'm not mistaken. Mistaken, um, but before um, I, I just think it's you know wonderful to see the boards and committees working together. I know that planning board played a leadership role in that, and I um, think that we should try everything we can to acquire both parcels. Mimi, well, can I add? Chauncey played a leadership role in pulling everybody together. Can, yes, can I add one, one final point? So kind of Debbie, it, it kind of plays off of what you just said at, you know, $250,000 an acre. If that's, you know, we still don't know if that's what it is technically per acre for this because it isn't a bona fide offer. But even if it is $250,000 an acre, um, you know, Currently, what's available, you don't get Chapter 61A parcels that become available all that often. You don't get an opportunity to purchase, you know, upwards of 10 acres or more of land in the town. And if you're looking at the monies that are in CPC and the being able to capitalize on that, you know, there is the potential on a four or five of those acres being able to put potentially 30 units. So I look at it from a from a, a larger picture that essentially. You know, so you spend 250000 an acre, but what you're getting back versus buying one house here, one house there um, for the same money, you're basically getting um, upwards of potentially 30 units. So I'll just leave end with that. Thank you. Yeah, and I forgot to mention, so the discussion was on, um, and this isn't my area of expertise, so maybe Mr. Stein can correct me, but um, there are community housing builders that will go in and they get all different kinds of federal and state tax. That is absolutely true. Cuts. And um, so having, turning the property over to them or some portion of it to let them build. And then we could get 100% affordable and not just at 80% AMI, you know, at 50 or 60 and a combination. So it would be a, um, a completely affordable development. We just need the will of all the stakeholders to come together and keep it moving in the right direction. Yeah, it was a, a, a positive start. So hopefully we can keep the ball rolling. Anything else? Anything else, Lisa? No. Thanks, Lisa. Thank, Thank you. you. The next item on the agenda, residents at Park Central. I don't think there's anything on that. I think they're due back on 4-4, I think. Uh, April 3rd. April 3rd. At 7 p.m. to be deterred, to, to be determined. Um, and it says, uh, topic of discussion, status of land court. And all that information is on the um, Board of Appeals, ZBA's website specifically. There's a link to all the submittals for each project, whether it's the uh, Park Central or 120 Turnpike. Anyone been following the court case? Anyone know what's going on there? No? No. Me either. 
So anything else on that? No. Um, next item on the agenda, 120 Turnpike Road, 40B. I don't have anything on that. Anything on that, Karina? Uh, no, the same. The uh, ZBA website indicates that April 24th, 2024 at 7 p.m., the hybrid meeting in uh, in Zoom in in person here at McAuliffe, special permit for the modification. Oh, no, that's different. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to take this back here. I think that's it. Uh, March 27th is a request to continue to April 24th. Um, let me see. This might be a, like a special permit for modification. Oh, the ZBA is hearing, according to their website, the special permit that they issued for the 2019 notice of decision um, because in their decision there was a findings related to the 6.2 acre area, and they're also requesting to have that removed there. So that's also on the CBA website. Um, yep. That's it. Ms. Houlihan. So they filed um, modifications for special permit and lid here. On the, and so we're hearing them on the 29th. They're going to ZBA on the 24th. So if, if the ZBA makes any sort of decision, does that impact us? Because if they change their findings from 2019, just curious, Well, hypothetically. I, so I spoke with town council Talman at his town house hours on March 20th. And I- Actually- was is it, this going beyond the public hearing that we just continued? This administrative. Okay. So because you're asking about um, the meeting timeline. The meeting timeline. And he says um, when you do decisions, um, you know, the boards can do basically what they want. And a decision is a new decision. So what you keep as conditions and what you don't, you explain there, but you also refer back to the original decision. Um, so... They said, town council said they would review our decision and will be reviewing the ZBA's decision as well. And Lara Davis, who's the business admin for ZBA, had reached out to me and asked, um, you know, sh should we have a meeting with ZBA planning board and um, another board, it could have been conservation, to, to determine, you know, uh, uh, just generally understand what's being asked and how it impacts from a legal viewpoint. So again, I don't think uh, town council was as concerned with what the, you know, the, the findings right now and the planning board can condition or whatever their decision will be, it will be in the new decision. So as far as these, I know what you're asking, will it impact the ZBA? They are asking about you know, how other boards feel. Okay. And, yeah. and I did say we were opening the public hearing. I can't recall ever a joint meeting between the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board in this town. Oh, really? <laughs> has, has, to our knowledge, has that ever happened? Mm -hmm. It certainly didn't happen when uh, you first came on the board. Maybe, if you remember, back in those days, we had a different different kind of relationship with the zoning board. Yes, I came in. I came in at the tail end of a mm. big upheaval in the town. <laughs> so that would really be something. Mimi, can I add one thing? Sure. So back when I was on the select board, and and uh, Aldo Sabriano was still town council, there was a form of a meeting. He did a training. Uh, he did one Saturday with ZBA, one Saturday with planning board, and then there was supposed to be a meeting where both sat down. Uh, I don't believe the sit down together meeting happened, but there, the, the intention was there, Jesse, for it to happen via a, a Saturday training. I just don't believe that the third meeting ever took place. Thank you. At least I can vouch for that because I think you were on select board at the time I was on ZBA. Yeah, and the third meeting yeah. didn't take place, but it was a helpful yeah. training, actually. So 
is that what's being proposed some sort of training for us or no it no. was a matter of an approach because um, in the discussions previously there were um, uh, mitigation options that were being discussed mm -hmm. and coming from via conservation's um, list of things that they wanted um, you know Melissa Danza has a list of projects that they're working on and initiatives and I believe that that applicant had consulted them and we were been talking about that outside you know during discussions prior to the public hearing opening and that you know the the boards just wanted to get a feel for you know who's on board with what mm -hmm. and th and that's when I indicated that well we're starting the public hearing for the modification as well and that you know they could attend the, the planning board meeting as well I see but the dis just to reiterate though the I think it's fairly clear that the decision about the disposition on that parcel lies solely with the planning board correct that's correct okay that's correct so it was the finding on the conservation um order of conditions and the zoning board special permit but it was both a finding and a condition for the parcel you're talking about on the planning board's uh site plan and special permit yeah so they're asking the zoning board to um, remove, a remove that finding, which I've never heard of such a thing. To me, that's like the historic record. But town council was saying you have a new decision, and it just doesn't have that in it, I guess. But it refers to the old one. So I don't know. So I don't know what the point that is. And they can't move forward with the 40B until the issue here at the planning board has been resolved. Yeah, and I don't know if it's helpful to the board, but I happen to have a copy of the um, ZBA application, um, the 2019. It might be in the Dropbox, but I'm not sure. It is. We put it up there. Oh, the whole application. Mm -hmm. Right. There's so a, you can see the folder of references. Yeah. Proposed it. It wasn't um, imposed on them by any board. It was part of the original. Yeah, it was part. Of, it was part of the the project. Yeah. Yes. One was the garage, two was the site improvements, and three was the open space donating to the town. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else on that? We have to talk until nine o'clock. Ah, <laughs> I'm about to do the planner's report. <laughs> oh. Take your time. Yes. <laughs> well, isn't that when we told Chris to come back? Uh, I sent him an email and I've not received the response. Okay. I think that's that on that. Next item on the agenda is the planner's report. Excuse me, Mimi. Do you want me to text Chris and let him know that the planning board's probably going to end before? Oh, nine? sure. Okay. Call him or go to his house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, so a couple of things. I just want to point out on the um, select board meeting scheduled for tomorrow evening, April 2nd at 6.30 p.m. Um, some of the items are recruitment for a building commissioner. Um, they're going to appoint Jean Novak, who was the recent um, part-time hire building inspector, um, who was working with the prior building inspector to interim building commissioner until they um, find a full term or unless he's suits the position. Um, and there's also a discussion on the planning, uh, planning for a fall town meeting at tomorrow night's select board. Um, um, as you're aware, at the March 13th select board meeting, the 2024 National Grid Vegetation Management Plan, which is actually for work in 2025, was um, accepted and approved. And we have an endorsed copy from the select board um and that's also when the mbta was communities was discussed with the planning board um 
there's a survey that Vanessa Hale had sent out um, regarding the tricentennial work, um, which um, Don Morris, prior planning board chair, I think he's the chair, right? He is. Dad? He stayed at 40. Yep. Yep. He did. Um, um, just back to the vegetation management plan, there was a question raised about, about whether the other poll users had a plan. Not that I'm aware of, but I would, um, the polls usually have the same utilities on, like the various, they're just at different heights based on their dangerousness, I think. So like the electrical lines are at the top, then you have cable, TV, and then whatever, fiber, whatever. Um, so the gas company, it, that's all underground, except, and you can see those same stretches that run cross country where everything's cleared. You'll have a station that's above ground, but the na the natural gas goes underground. Um, but like cable and, and seen, cable phone. runs on the same utility poles as electric. So, didn't at the meeting didn't Luke the National Grid say that they d used to have a contract with the other poll users and they would take care of yeah and they they dropped they dropped national grid so are they not maintaining <laughs> no we'll have to do more things by their wires or are they um cutting in violation of mass general law so are you saying that there are um lines that run that aren't national grid that just service cable no 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 no. but national grid's higher i don't i'm not a poll person one who raised this at the select board meeting it would help it always helps tim mm -hmm. so um my understanding has has in you and you are sir <laughs> i'm still <different. laughs> I think all night um so uh, I made an observation last August that when I looked in my neighborhood um, that the uh, tree work that was done cleared the high tension lines at the top of, of the poles that didn't address the low voltage lines that go from the, from the transformers to the houses and not the cable and communication lines that are a bit further down on the poles. We've dug into it a little bit and um, we're told that um, Verizon, you know, which is the primary thing on the pr primary uh, tenant of the poles, um, uh, came around separately. Charter is at roughly the same level. We don't, I don't know what they're uh, currently doing. And there are other tenants on the poles, including the town's right. private fiber network um, and you know, just various others. So my question at the um, select board meeting at the, at the hearing for this was, um, A, you know, why aren't the other utilities involved, uh, Mr. Tree Warden, since you're responsible for obtaining vegetation management plans from all of them, um, and uh, to the extent that, that work is being done, why isn't it coordinated? Because it doesn't make sense for the utilities to pay for separate police details. It doesn't make sense for the town to uh, have their traffic disrupted, you know, three, four, five times as you walk your way down the down the pole. And the response of the select board was, we're only going to deal with national grid. We're not interested in this bigger issue. But that's that's sort of the summary of the conversation. So if I could just add a, a few years ago, I had a discussion with one of the police officers because there was some cutting of a tree on Parkerville Road. And I called and happened to speak to one of the officers. It was um, Heath Wittes. Yeah, it was Heath Wittes at the time. And and he explained to me the process. Um, and he clearly told me that there were different, um, you know, tenants on the pole and that they would come at different times and that they would, um, you know, just as we think that the national grid would come and they would do detailing and that if it was a spectrum charter, they would come and they would do detailing. And that's, there was, he said at, at the time, it's a shame there's no coordination. Now, we did hear from National Grid that the relationship seems to have fallen apart or some sort of agreement has fallen apart. But I think that we don't know, does that mean everybody's out for themselves or does that mean nothing's getting done? Um, 
So I really think that they do need to have a vegetative management plan, and I think we should follow up and get it from the other tenants. So maybe add that this to the discussion with uh, Bill and Chris, because it's, yeah. Okay. Under under the law for a tree warden, the tree warden is uh, is authorized to require the um, utilities to provide vegetation management plans. And, you know, if they're not doing it, you know, it's another part of the job that currently isn't being done. I mean, the only part of the tree warden job that is being done right now is worry about hazardous trees, so-called. Well, they are requ they are requesting and getting the vegetation management plan from National Grid, Grid. which wasn't yeah. happening. And, you know, nothing is being done in terms of, you know, planning for tree health or tree planting no, or you know, can go on down that line another night. Okay, so we'll also Sorry. do some research and see uh, if we have contacts to reach out to their um, um, field people who oversee those plans. Not field people, but who oversee the field people who do that. Okay. Uh, it appears that MMLA has reviewed the bill, one of those groups has, and they found lots of errors and discrepancies and things that they're writing comment letter to, which was um, also in the Dropbox and in that email I sent you. So we'll keep our eyes on that and see what happens. Okay, um, 37 Clifford and the tree removal there. Um, so latest news is that this morning, um, the DPW director, Bill Cundiff, has reached out to the resident um, to look for their um, intended mitigation. As we spoke last meeting, the select board as the tree warden is the um, the entity that deals with um, any fines or mitigation when it comes to that. Um, so then why is Bill reaching out? Because he drafted the letter originally, <laughs> right? I think that uh, the first letter that went out and that was dropped at the door and then there was one sent certified mail. Um, so in the interim, the resident reached out because the letter had said to talk to either me or Melanie Atsuko, who's the executive administrative assistant. Um, and then there was um, some pressure from planning board and others that this should be followed up on. And so I think this is that last step so far. So we'll see. I think that the resident is quite willing to, has, had already offered to, you know, what does the town want? Please tell us because they didn't do it maliciously. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let me see what else here. So, um, open space monitor. Go ahead. You go. You want to still say something? I just, I, I think there should be a way to hold the tree companies responsible. They work in Massachusetts. They should know what the law is. And didn't you mention it, the law to them? <laughs> I did. I told them that if they cut on on the on the public right away, that is illegal. And then I took a picture of the, the information and I shared it with Karina. So we know who they are. Um, we can go back to photos. I'm sure I have them somewhere too. Yeah, we saved them. Um, and we should probably let them know that there's a fine. But that's not my... <laughs> yeah, and that just to be... Uh, or they shouldn't be allowed to cut down trees. And the resident trees. has said that... He, they had asked the tree company, and according to the resident, they had said that they were taking care of all, any permits. And Yeah, they had the de police detail. I mean, this goes yeah. right to Deb's point, is the police detail was hired. They were do doing it. They were cutting a tree, but there was no checks and balances. Right. 
Maybe we should loop the police in to know that like trees can't be cut down on them right away. Okay. On the tree policy, we can start that chain of <laughs> information to them. Okay. Um, I'm going to start working on the open space president uh, open space monitoring list of locations. So if anybody has any particular area they want me to look, I usually um, uh, coordinate with Freddie Gillespie, open space preservation chair on this list. Um, she gives me any feedback and then we get that going for this fiscal year. And part of that will also be to have them um, maybe approach a, some structure of mitigation plan some sort. So we're working on it. Time goes by really fast. <laughs> um, and that's what we have for this evening. Yeah, yes. Can I add one, one thing? Sure. I sure. need to bring it up, I think, last meeting, but um, I think sometime in February or early March, the um, select board um, uh, issued a proclamation for Arbor Day. And I can't find it, but I know they did it because I was in the audience. And Arbor Day is April 26th mm -hmm. um, coming up. And so I was wondering if there's any way we can put that proclamation on our web page or on our planning board page or try to get it on the front page of the um, uh, the town website. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just wondering, yeah, if we could do something. And also a question is, does the planning board do anything for Arbor Day? Well, we had in the past. So first answer is yes. Colleen, you can put that on the planning board yeah. website and maybe do a news flash, like conservation puts out a, a, an email flash. Um, awesome. In the past, we were able to have um, one of the nurseries donate a tree, and then we had a small planting ceremony. Um, we hadn't in the past year um actually we had a couple trees so there was also a tree that was part of a subdivision condition to plant a tree somewhere else and we had planted one between trotter and um neary school uh, be in between the two schools there was one there um so if you have any ideas if you have any connections um i know when we did it dawn um and kate who was our recording secretary at the time went to the nursery and talked to them and um, convinced them to donate a tree. So they did. Um, I can talk to Melissa Danza to see if she has any um, connection there as well. But it just takes a matter of time to be able to get out there and do that. And right now we're a little bit strapped because um, we're picking up a little bit of the building commissioner assistance and we're happy to help them. Um, it's just that there's a lot of construction going on and it's it's tough to keep them all compliant. <laughs> I had a question about um, the the trees that were removed right here in the back of this building. And at the old school? No, right here at the townhouse and that, that strip. Oh, of the when they were removed, I thought that they were going to be replaced. And just in full disclosure, I did reach out to um, Bill Cundiff at the DPW. And I asked him also if he would put the proclamation on the DPW mm -hmm. website. I. I did get copied on one of his newsletters, so I think he started up a newsletter. So I just maybe just planting a little seed and trying to ask if he would um, do something like that. And I I did tell him I thought that you know there's other at least other towns do some sort of symbolic planting, and that would really mean a lot I think to people in Southboro. And I was so bold as to say, how about the trees in the parking lot behind this behind this townhouse? Um, I thought that they were going to be replaced, but I don't know the situation. Of course, it has nothing to do with planning board, and really, that's my own personal suggestion to him. Um, and he, you know, he did ask also if the planning board was planning anything. Um, but I don't have any connect connections to trees, but I do think that the tree should be replaced behind this building. And I think that's probably out of somebody's budget. I think that that's um, under John Parent, and I think. That is the plan. There's other like planting because a lot of the planting by the townhouse was removed and it's going to be. The shrubs are gone along. This oh, okay. Yeah. I noticed that this morning. Stood out. So just to close that, 
let's see what we can do. I know that the um, Tree City USA as part of the yearly application looks for some indication of an event. And for this past year, um, we had asked Chris Leroy, Leroy if they had done anything and they had planted some trees in the cemetery, um, which we're gonna try and count towards that, yeah. right? And um, we'll see what we can do, see if we can drum something up. Arbor Day is coming up very quickly. It's the 26th. 26th. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And we should post that on the post on the board downstairs where we put public yeah. hearings and stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Welcome back, Mr. Robbins. Do you want to? Once one second, Chris. Sorry. There's a hand raised. On. One sec. There's a hand raised in the audience that we have to the virtual virtual audience. Hi, can you yes, hear me? Yes, Mr. Farrington. Yep. If you could just identify yourself. Hi, uh, Grant address. Farrington, 50 Flag. Yeah, Grant Farrington, 50 Flag Road. Um, I'm glad the uh, planning board was talking about the topic of tree planting. Um, I just wanted to see if there's a status update on the uh, tree hearings from uh, last year, I believe, and the year before, in which you know dozens of trees were removed. Um, there were plans to, or at least at, at the time it was stated that, that um, there were plans to replace, uh, you know, a number of the trees that had been removed. I believe it was, I don't know the exact number. It was definitely dozens. I would say over 50. I can't remember if it was over 100, but um, just wanted to see if there's a status update on whether or not. Um, you know, trees were planted to, uh, you know, to replace the trees that were cut down last year, and I believe the year before as well. Um, not yet. The first step is to uh, do a tree inventory and find out where the best place to plant trees are, and we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Now, now Mr. Robin, sorry about that. I have, oh, good evening. I'm Chris Robbins. I live at 39 Parkerville Road. And I did go home because I figured this would be one of those midnight hour meetings. And so, but Lisa called me in desperation, get over here, Chris. And I did. I won't tell you how fast I went, but I went so fast, I went right by town hall. So forgive me. Um, but I'm here to talk about one issue that's very important to me, and I think the whole community. We have two eyesores in the center of our town. We have a dirt pile that sits where it used to be a gas station that's waiting for development. And we have another site at the end of my street that I live on. I live on 39 Parkerville Road. And at the end is the old Andrea restaurant. My son used to wash dishes there. But the good news is the town went out of its way to pass um, a new um, zoning bylaw for the downtown, which was helpful. And, um, but both of these sites are in extraordinary locations. We don't think about it, but would you believe that Newton Street carries, I, one of the officers at the medical center said, we get 60,000 patients a year into this medical center. That's enormous. And that pile of dirt is a critical, message setter about how this town might operate or doesn't operate. And I've even talked to the bank. The bank has talked to me, says, Chris, are they gonna do anything about this? So that's a grave concern to a lot of people. How do we look as a community? And also the Andrea restaurant, we've got hundreds of thousands of cars who go by there. And I'm sure there are people say, when are they gonna get this together? And the good news is we have people like yourselves and others on committees who are working night and day to do all the right things and set the right, um, put the right programs, buildings, facilities in place that will attract people to this town. And when you look at the history of the things you've done, it's enormous. But we're at a time today where feeding uh, Towns and communities are competing for businesses. 
And it's our job. And, and this is my recommendation, straightforward. Oh, uh, and the downtown hasn't become a vi as vibrant in terms of appearance for many years. So um, I think right now is prime time for this committee and the other committees that are responsible to come together in some format to accelerate uh, the way in which permits, I, I'm not saying change the permit process, but we've got to find a better way where we can turn these projects into a success and um, create a vibrant look about how we exist as a community in terms of the businesses that can come here, the jobs we create, and the revenues that can come from the tax flow. So lead the way as you have done so well for so many years, add some momentum to get the key players involved in a way that will allow us to be proud. So when we reach at least the, our anniversary year, we maybe can cut a blue ribbon for both sides. And I, I applaud your good and, and hard work. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Uh, whom is the owner of the parcel in question? Which question? The dirt. You, you were referring to a specific site? Oh, the one down on Newton Street uh, and Main Street is owned by Mr. Bemis. And uh, what exactly is your ask? Since there, is, since there is no submission before this board regarding that parcel, what exactly is your ask of the planning board? What I'm asking for? Or yes. He's, oh, that we take action to meet with the owner to find out what we can do to accelerate a development there. I'm not here to go in and get in and debate about it, which should be this or that. We um, Now, I'm not representing the Economic Development Committee. I'm, this is me as, you know, Parkerville Road resident. So you're asking us to reach out to Mr. Bemis? Yes. And ask him to come in and discuss yes. this lot with him, with yes. us? Yes. And I, other, I, have, I have no objection to that. Wait, um, you know that... The uh, Economic Development Committee did have Mr. Bemis in asking about that lot and whether he was going to move forward with something. And he indicated he was too busy at the present time. He's got a lot going on with his business. Well, just know I've been detached from the Economic Development Committee for quite a while now. So I'm not uh, up to date on... But I think we have to take this to another level. We just... We can't allow somebody to keep a dirt pile in the center of our town and nothing happens. There has to be a way in which we can, in a, in a thoughtful way, uh, seek ways in which we can change his thoughts or ideas and get his input if we did something that was different. Have um, you reached out to Mr. Bemis? Did I? Yes. Well, a while back, but I didn't, what I'm avoiding tonight, I'm not here to debate line item debates on zoning and who said what to whom. I'm saying that I think great towns step up to a cause and when there seems to be resistance, works with others to create a team approach to finding a way to move this thing uh, in a way that's gonna be reflective of how well you've done over the years to keep this town looking beautiful and uh, provide a wonderful place for business to grow. May I just add? Oh, go ahead. Mark. Oh, I was just going to also like just moving off of the main street and in May of last year, I think it was May, we approved a car condo at Parkerville and Route yes. 9. So they did like developers do put a bulldozer there and dug up. So it started work, but there, I mean, I don't think there's anything we can do at this They just point. reached out to me today the attorney for the project and said they were going to be submitting a, a request for an extension to the major site plan because they're working on some conservation related items before they start. But that that is in the works at 241, 245 turnpike. That's in the works, Chris. And there's a car condo complex yeah. proposed there. So it's moving. It is. It's slow going, but the, you know, it's reflective of the economy. So yeah, beyond rules and regulations, I believe that every committee, each of you has a sphere of influence, individuals and other committees. And you don't need another bylaw to change necessarily. You need a group of people to really put appropriate, timely and thoughtful pressure on these people who may have delayed these projects. And there may be good reasons, but enough is enough. The downtown 
deserves to be a first class community. And I think your influence and asking questions for updates, asking for other players in the town to step in and influence decision makers, um, you're in a key role and responsibility and you've done great things before and I think you can help this town improve those two sides. So if we do request Mr. Bemis to come before us and we request him to be proactive with the site and he tells us he's too busy, what would you recommend we do at that point? That's another topic. <laughs> I don't have the solution, but guess what? Every town has a uh, something that gets in the way. And there's got to be a creative uh, way to, to enable this project to move forward. And I, and I commend you to it. You've got the great team and working with others, um, I think it'll make a big difference. And I think bringing Mr. Bemis in and uh, expressing your concerns and needs uh, might make a difference. There might be an individual here who has personal influence over Mr. Bemis in terms of debating with him what would be advantageous for him. <laughs> I know some things just are too hard to do, but I wish you and I wish you luck. And I just know I hear about these two sites all over town and it really, you guys have done great work What's interesting is you see what this, the the uh, nonprofit schools have done. Bay School has painted up its buildings. Town Hall is fixing up its buildings. The church right here just fixed up the tower. Most people don't realize that tower has been there for almost a hundred years, and the Burnett family built that church, and this town helped support it. So we're doing great things to sustain the town uh, where B uh, lives. Um, the Choate family gave that to the town. We've got a beautiful community, and I just think we've got to somehow find levers that will get these projects started and completed. We deserve it. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Uh, just one last note on that, that I do know that um, Mr. Bemis was contacted about the stockpiles because a complaint was received at the building department, and um, the prior building commissioner was in the works of... Uh, contacting Mr. Bemis regarding um, potential zoning violation for stockpiling. It's not a contractor's yard, so you can't stockpile materials there. So that was in the works. Um, but just so you know, that the attention has been given to that site in that direction, at least. So. Well, I think you've got a great responsibility and, and, and you all have made a difference before. And, and uh, I say, carry on and go forward as you've done before. Thank you. Uh, motion is to approve the minutes from the planning board meeting that took place on February 20th, 2024. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor. Luttrell, yes. Stein, yes. Lillian, yes. Demiria, yes. Horatio, yes. Motion is to approve the planning board minutes from February 26, 2024. Second. I have a motion and a second. I have one little thing. Um, line 47, the name of Mr. Bartolini Street is W-Y-E-T-H instead of W, instead of wire. <laughs> Wyeth. And that's it. Anything else on that? Seeing none, all in favor, Latrell, yes. Stein, yes. Julian, yes. Demiria, yes. Horatio, yes. Uh, the motion is to approve the minutes from March 4th, 2024. Second. I have a motion and a second. I have one little thing on there. Oh, I have the same thing on line 79, Wyeth. And did you have something? Um, Colleen, did you fix the day at the top? It's a Monday, not a Tuesday. 
I go to here too, so I'll mark this so that you can have that. Okay. Anything else? As amended, Latrell, yes. Stein, yes. Julian, yes. Demurio, yes. Gracio, yes. A motion is to approve the planning board minutes for March 19th, 2024. Um, what about March 11th? I apologize. <laughs> uh, since I've made the motion for March 19th, okay. may we complete that one? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, I will be abstaining as I did not attend the meeting. Anything else? Seeing none, all in favor, Luttrell, yes. Sign up to abstain. Julian, yes. Demurio, yes. Brasio, yes. And the motion is to approve the planning board minutes from March 11th, 2024. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, discussion. I have something on... Line 38 states Miss Braccio stated she is frustrated with the butters. I I think that in Lisa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you this was on 264 Quarterville. I think your frustration, you were frustrated along with the um uh, the abutters or yes, as well as <laughs> the butters, yeah. but not at the okay. Yes. Um, and then on line 86, it's the same, uh, Wyeth. Anything else on that? Seeing none, all in favor, Luttrell, yes. Stein, yes. Julian, yes. Demuria, yes. Brasio, yes. Um, motion is to approve the planning board minutes from the pre-town meeting that took place on March 23rd, 2024. Second with discussion. Yes. Um, the meeting adjourned at 4.25 p.m. Not 9.04 or whatever the meeting time was. Did you already have this for? You already did the two before. Your meeting minutes should reflect also documents used as referencing um, the two reports to ATM. I don't know if you have that copy of it. Okay. Okay. Any more discussion on that? I do have a question. On line 65, it says next meetings, February 26, 2024, March. Mm -hmm. I'm not understanding why this is, am I misreading the minutes? No. On line 65, this, 66. So this, is, uh, this is meeting minutes for March 23rd. So where it says next meeting, that is let must be left over from a prior meeting. Sure. That should be deleted, so be fixed. please. So, um, so and, and just to, along the lines of, of uh, Ms. Houlihan's point, um, I think that we made a, I think that we, was there a motion that the meeting stay open? Would continue until um, until uh, the end of town meeting. And we did adjourn at the yep. end of town meeting. Yes. Is that okay? I just have to wait for anything. No, there's another motion. No, there's a motion to be added where they said they're going to, they voted to um, continue and adjourn at the end of the town meeting. So we have to add one more motion. And it, you can look at my notes. It's probably in the last sheet there. Colleen prepared these. Um, I was just asking that. Are you doing our minutes now? No, just that one. Oh, okay. Oh, because there's no you. No way to record it. So I told them, don't worry. I'll... Well, there was, but we didn't get it working. <laughs> Okay, so anything else on that? Okay. Are you all set on that, Lisa? Yes, thank you. Okay. Seeing none, all in favor, Luttrell, yes. Stein, yes. Julian, yes. Demuria, yes. Braccio, yes. And um, do you entertain a motion to adjourn? But it's way too early. <laughs> yes. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, Luttrell, yes. Stein, yes. Pan, yes. Muria, yes. Thank you, everyone. Rascio, yes. We just need you to sign. Thank you, Lisa.
Thanks, Lisa. We'll come Thank by you. if we can get your signature on two on these documents sometime in the next day or two. Is yes, the just... ANR and the two sixty four approved plans, and then the ANR endorsement form. Okay. I'll, okay. teach, I'll touch base with you in the morning. We can hear you, but we, uh, you can okay. email me when you can come by. <laughs> okay. Or we can come to your house and you can pop outside if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.